Imagine Salem Village, 1692. A community cloaked in a somber piety, where every rustle in the wind and every failed harvest could be interpreted as a sign of divine displeasure. Life in this Puritan theocracy was harsh and unforgiving. Winters were brutal, the land yielded meager crops, and a seemingly endless war with the Native Americans gnawed at the edges of their existence. As if these hardships weren't enough, a recent smallpox outbreak had swept through the village, leaving a trail of death and debilitation. Fear, a constant companion, tightened its grip on the hearts of the villagers. With no scientific understanding of illness, they clung to the belief that misfortune stemmed from forces beyond the natural world. This pervasive anxiety created a tinderbox, ready to ignite at the slightest spark. Enter a group of young girls, perhaps cooped up indoors during the long winter, their imaginations fueled by fireside stories of demonic pacts and witchcraft. These girls, influenced by a potent cocktail of social pressures, boredom, and possibly even mass hysteria, began exhibiting strange behavior. They contorted their bodies into impossible positions, shrieked uncontrollably, and spouted nonsensical utterances. Doctors, baffled by their symptoms, offered no explanation. The girls, feeding off each other's anxieties, started pointing fingers, accusing specific townspeople of witchcraft, a convenient explanation for their ailments in a world obsessed with the demonic. Here, we enter the fascinating realm of convergent illness, a phenomenon where shared anxieties and witnessing each other's symptoms can manifest as physical ailments within a group. Another theory suggests that ergot poisoning from rye bread, which can cause hallucinations and erratic behavior, may have played a role. However, the evidence for this remains inconclusive. The colonial legal system, designed for a simpler time, was woefully unprepared for such a crisis. Judges, steeped in religious fervor, readily accepted the concept of witchcraft. Even dreams and visions, referred to as spectral evidence, were given weight in court despite their inherent unreliability. Cotton Mather, a prominent Puritan minister with a penchant for the dramatic, further stoked the fires of hysteria. He saw the events in Salem as a cosmic battle between God and the devil, urging for a relentless pursuit of witches. His pronouncements, delivered with the full force of his religious authority, served to legitimize the accusations and whip the community into a frenzy. The witch hunt quickly morphed into a social weapon of terrifying efficiency. Long-held grudges festered, property disputes reignited, accusations became a tool for settling scores and eliminating rivals. The marginalized, the poor, and those who challenged the rigid social order, particularly outspoken women who didn't conform to societal expectations, became easy targets. In a society that viewed independence with suspicion, these individuals were especially vulnerable. The witch hunt became a way to purge the community of anyone deemed different or inconvenient. The court proceedings were a grotesque parody of justice. The accused had no defense attorneys, the burden of proof was essentially reversed, and the methods used to test for witchcraft were as barbaric as they were ineffective. The swimming test, for instance, involved throwing a bound suspect into water. If they floated, they were deemed witches. If they sank, they were innocent. Another method involved sticking pins into poppets made in the likeness of the accused. The theory was that if the accused felt pain when a pin was inserted, they were guilty. These methods were designed to elicit confessions through pain and fear, not to determine guilt or innocence. The inevitable outcome was a bloodbath. Innocent men, women, and even children were hanged on the flimsiest evidence. The specter of accusation hung heavy in the air, turning neighbor against neighbor and tearing families apart. Paranoia became a way of life, and the already harsh conditions in the jails worsened with overcrowding and disease claiming additional lives. The idyllic image of a Puritan utopia crumbled under the weight of fear and suspicion. But a tide, though slow and hesitant, eventually began to turn. As the accusations became increasingly outlandish, targeting respected members of the community and even the governor's wife, public skepticism grew. Reasonable voices began to question the legitimacy of the trials, particularly when spectral evidence was no longer admissible. Governor Phipps, alarmed by the spiraling chaos and potential economic fallout, intervened. He halted the trials and established a superior court with stricter rules of evidence, effectively putting an end to the madness. 
The legacy of the Salem witch trials is a dark stain on American history. Families were shattered, the community fractured, and the fear of accusations lingered for generations. Salem's reputation was tarnished, leading to economic hardship as trade routes bypassed the ostracized town. While the accused were eventually exonerated, centuries later, this served as a hollow victory for those who lost their lives on Gallows Hill. The trials became a symbol of injustice and a stark reminder of the dangers of mob mentality and unchecked fear. The Salem Witch Trials stand as a stark reminder of the dangers of fear, intolerance, and the erosion of reason during times of crisis. These events echo throughout history, from the witch hunts of medieval Europe to the McCarthy era's Red Scare and beyond. They highlight the importance of critical thinking, due process, and a fair justice system that protects the rights of the accused. We must learn from the past to prevent such tragedies from repeating, ensuring that reason, not fear, guides our actions. The Salem Witch Trials serve as a chilling testament to the fragility of human rationality and a cautionary tale for the future. By remembering the mistakes of the past, we can strive to create a more just and equitable society where reason and compassion prevail. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. It's London Lee!